Welcome back, everybody. I think we'll start out and we'll look at the midterm distribution. I'll give you your scores back at the end. Um, so we'll just try to understand what does it all mean? You know, I used to hate getting my score back, and it's like, it's whatever it is, 75. What does it mean? So it doesn't mean anything on its own. So these are all good stats lessons that everything is relative. And so how you baseline it and compare it, you need to know a lot about me, and you don't know me that well yet. So what do my scores mean? Uh, so let's have a look at those. Let me get this plug in. And then we're going to jump gears and move into chapter 7. I'll assign some uh, more practice problems from the book. I think we will do a review session tomorrow, just in case you're having any questions about the, the simulation study. It's built in that you're supposed to think about stuff and report like what you observe. That's kind of what STATS is. It's not always getting the right answer, it's explaining what matters. So in the context of some problem. And so that's what I'm hoping you guys will glean out of this. Some of you might be thinking, can I test on that? I am testing on it through the simulation assignment and looking at the quality of your work. This becomes more important as you start doing research. So yeah, we test on it all the time and that's not really why we're here. So I'll try to make that point a little bit more clear when I get back to the, the midterm as well, that we're not just trying to optimize points in this class, and if that's how you're thinking about it, you are not a researcher. So if you're thinking about it, that I'm getting a lot out of all of this stuff, and through my mistakes I know what to do next, you are a researcher. So it's more of a temperament. So just keep all that in mind. Um, I graded the midterms. And so I'll show you the scores now. Here they are. So, so we're statisticians. We like data. That's all there is, right? No. I never look at data like this. So show me a table of data or a vector of data. It doesn't mean very much. What would you like to know about this? What would be important to you? Oh, wow. Just right off the bat. We want the distribution. So good. So that's what I want to so I'm not that interested in anything else. I want to see the distribution first. That's all the information. This is the first time in about 15 years anybody's asked for that first. So usually people ask for the mean, and I would love to wean you off of that. This assignment as well is supposed to wean you off of it, the simulation assignment, a little bit. So the distribution. Let's look at a histogram. It's right. So I would probably have to make this a little prettier for you to make this really useful, but I'll just try to expand it and point out what the bounds are. Um, of course, distributions, it always depends on like what the bin size is, the bin width and all this stuff. But this is 97 right there. I did see a 100 out of everything. And this is over in the 40s. Uh, I compared to previous distributions, and this is starting to look more regular, like what I usually observe. So usually I get a bimodal distribution out of these classes. Last year was super interesting. I got a uniform distribution on this first one, and I thought that was just super bizarre. And it kind of means the left tails are a little bit heavy. I think through COVID, we didn't have a lot of assessment. We're a little bit lost. Our foundations might be a little bit rusty and so I think that uniform distribution reflects that. Uh, I think this is starting to get back to the, the more typical thing. I want to say normal. That's not Gaussian. So I don't mean normal in that fashion. Uh, that there's you know our stat PhD students, there's people that are catching up that are in engineering disciplines. They don't know as much about distributions right now. And so all of this is overcomable. So of course, if you see yourself in here, you're going to have to really pick it up. Now, this could be one of a couple things. It could be just nerves. It could be that you're not fast. You have to think through this stuff a little bit faster. And so this is going to be an indicator that you want to practice more. So again, this is all in the spirit of practice. This class is about to get harder. So, and in some sense, maybe it's easier, you know, that it's more structured. So chapter seven, is probably the most one of the more technical chapters and chapter eight gets a lot more technical maybe that is easier for you 
So you can anticipate what I'm going to ask rather than concepts. So, and a bunch of stuff. So we'll keep going back to the old stuff, but keep practicing it. And I would, I would recommend change the distributions on problems you already know how to do, just to keep practicing. There is no secret in this class. There's only one way to get good. And it's not sitting back and reading the book and trying to, through osmosis, try to understand this. People that are good at this work lots of problems work the examples in the book. And I think at this point, um, you'll recognize that some of the questions I asked you are directly from the book. So in examples. So for instance, show that S squared and X bar are sufficient statistic, minimal sufficient. Um, I think I just said sufficient statistic on the example. They are minimal sufficient. Um, some of you invoke the factorization theorem, and that would be the fast way to do it. Um, some of you tried to work through transformations of things. It's in the book how they do it. So they do transform the Jacobian is one in that example, or it's a constant. And so you can go through that if you want to do the long-winded way, which the, the book with my test was prompting you for. If you did apply the factorization theorem, that would be a faster way to through, go through that problem. Um, both are fine. So we can talk a little bit more. What I would like when I give these back to you at the end, don't just come up to me and say, you marked me off four extra points right here. I think it was a little bit punitive. I do do that sometimes by mistake. I try to go back through, regrade everything, make sure I'm consistent, but I'm also human. So if there's a big problem you want to talk to me, don't come to me panicked. We'll work it out. So if you're right, you're right. And so and we'll go through it. Uh, tomorrow during review session, so let me just make a note, we'll do review tomorrow. We can also talk about this, and if you're like, how would you address a certain problem on the exam, we can discuss it in the review session. So tomorrow review. Review at 5.30. So I imagine that, so typical place, same place as always. Uh, I imagine there'll be simulation questions. We can work through that. I imagine it won't take too long because we won't be rifling through a whole bunch of book problems tomorrow. But we can talk about this as well. But what I'd also like to offer you is if you are really disappointed and the points concern you a lot, and that's what I don't want you to worry about, I want you to learn the material, um, you can redo the midterm. So in its entirety, so even if you've done problems correctly, I want you to do them again because practice is good. And so write it up cleanly. I don't care if it's latex or handwritten, but just make sure it's neat. Make sure it's neat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so well written out. And, um, and I will regrade it. And I will give you half the points back from the difference between 100 and your score. So for instance, if you get a 50% on the exam, the difference between 100 and 50 is 50, I'll give you 25 of those points back. So realistically, this should be a 100 when you turn it in. Pay attention to little features of the remainder in those Taylor expansions. Maybe I marked you off three points or something by saying, I don't think you've explained this sufficiently well. So that's a little subjective on my point, on my part. And being able to interpret that, it's all meant to be in your favor, you're good, so that you're prepared for the qualifying thing. And so go back through the book, see if you can do it by yourself, write it up neatly. I'll say, um, you have two weeks to turn it back. So midterm makeup. So you'll write out the entire exam in its entirety neatly, turn it in, and I would say two weeks from today, whatever that date is, it's a Monday, it's a Monday, um, and this is when it's due. So hopefully that alleviates a little bit of that. I think I'm still aiming for another in-class midterm for the next one just to keep testing you and getting you prepared for taking an exam that way. I think on probably the final exam I'll give you a, a take home.
so that I can be a little bit more thorough about the concepts and make sure that you have a good overview of everything as well. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to know about this? Distribution. Hey, I'm not saying that I wouldn't want to know the mean. <laughs> so I'm just saying it's not the first thing I want to know. I want to know, you know, what the spread, what does the distribution look like? Are means even reasonable? How skewed is this thing? But the mean, I did compute. Of course I looked at this as well. So mean 75. Okay, so that's all hard. Um, every time I go through an exam for the first time, I'm always like, oh, these mistakes are horrible. You know, and then I start realizing they're easily correctable. And so that's what I did when I looked at it. The mean in this class is always right around 75 for this. So actually, this is pretty regular. Regular. So high is 100. There was a 97, I think, was the next one, 98. There are a couple of people clustered around there. And so those are all, to me, about 100. So about the same sort of thing. So think about this, like, statistically. You know, you're in the ballpark. Can you improve the process so that you can make your score higher next time? That's how you want to think about this. So we can think about standard deviations or what's not. Um, I would say the way that I look at this, let's just look again, um, the histogram. The way I look at this, and this is probably the, the most important thing, is what are the grades here? So I would stare at this, and of course these are A's. Obviously, those are clear A's. So I would say this stuff looks very A-like. So the mean's right around here. So I don't know, this is grad school. So those are all A's. And I would say these things are some version of B's. A minuses, B's, stuff like that. So here's another way you can think about it. the extra credit assignments that I kind of have discussed doing the MCMC project. So MCMC changed the proposal to the local proposal for the problem that they talk about in the book. The T's from the normals. Sam tried to code that up already, and he demonstrated that actually this normal proposal for the T will never really sample the tails. He pointed that out to me. So you're like, you can just turn that thing in with a small adaptation, and I'll give you, what did I say? Is that 5% midterm credit? That's another, what's that? 50%. Well, if you add it up, I'll say, yeah, right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Not exactly the point. So, and then the, the other problem, if you want to adapt to experiment or two, that constrained normalish distribution, you can write up the MCMC. You know, another page of write up, and that's 10% midterm credit. I'll try to give you some more extra credit along the way if you want to code those things up. What I used to do through grad school is I'd code these things up anyway, I just wouldn't write them up. And so if you want to write them up or something like that, I'll give you a lot of percentage of credit. So experience does matter in this class. Um, lots of pathways to an A. Um, and then, of course, the makeup. So if you do find yourself on the low side of this, you're over here. At this point in this class, there's, there's a lot of ways you can still get an A, so and do really well. So take this at least as a motivator and not uh, don't take discouragement from it. Exactly the opposite. Okay. I didn't see anything in here that wasn't correct. Okay. Um, anything else you want to know? Medians, modes, they're all not in there. So plus or minus five points, something like that. Okay. Um, which way do you think the median goes? You think it's to the right or the left of the, the mean? The mean is, yeah, the mean is about here. I'd say the mean is probably when I look at this, it's probably getting shifted by this right here. And so the mean's probably over to the right a little bit from the median. So the median's in 75, you know, so that's not bad. That, that's, so if you get these scores back and you're like at 58 or something like that, you're close. Okay, so think about it like that. Okay, point estimation. We'll turn these out, I'll hit the, the end of the class. 
switch gears. We left off last time talking about the likelihood principle, and I kind of gave you what the likelihood principle light says. So the likelihood principle says something that's a little bit strong in the sense that it says if you believe in the sufficiency principle and you want your inferences to adhere to it, which you should. So there's no good reason to say, I would, I would like to not use sufficient statistics. I'd like less information from my data. So once we learn a little bit more about variability, um, this drives down variability, obviously. And so that's what we want to drive down in our estimates. So using sufficient statistics, one of the messages I'll, I'll say is if you're not using the sufficient statistic, you can get feet pretty easily. Um, we'll learn about something called route lateralization later on, but basically it says use of sufficient statistic no matter what. Um, the conditionality principle is a little bit more contentious, but should you condition just on your data? In the example that we saw at the end, computing p-values, so experimenter one assumed the distribution was binomial, experimenter two assumed that it was negative binomial, both arbitrary assumptions, I would say, and when they went to integrate over the tail areas of the distribution, they were violating the conditionality principle. So they are looking at their data and more stream data, given the direction of the alternative hypothesis. So they weren't conditioning just on the data. They were letting the more extremity in the data to dictate their decision. And so and the key point was those p-values could be different, you know? And so potentially that might be on your, the line of your thresholding rule. And so, and it was because of some arbitrariness, the stopping rule that experimenter two and experimenter one disagreed up on um, that they came up with different inferences, potentially. Different decisions, potentially, but that different inferences if you use that key value thing. So the most annoying thing that Bayesians can possibly do is just say, on oh, a violation of the likelihood principle. So, because we never ever said you had to use it. What the likelihood principle says in its entirety, and it's a pretty strong statement, is that if the likelihood functions for two different experiments using two different data, two different modeling principles, if the likelihoods are the same, the inferences should be the same. But what they're leaving out is what do you do with the likelihood function in the first place? So just because the likelihood functions are the same, your inferences should be the same. I kind of agree with that. I think that that's not an unreasonable thing to think. Um, I tend to side with that. Um, the overstatement of the likelihood principle is that it is a direct consequence of the conditionality principle and the sufficiency principle. So if you accept the sufficiency principle and the conditionality principle, you must accept the likelihood principle. That is an overstatement. That is the part that everybody fights about. What you can say, though, is likelihood functions um, have the sufficient statistics built into them because they're conditional on the data. So, and you're conditioning on the data itself. So you're following both principles. So the likelihood function using that has the right built-in constraints. And so I think likelihood functions are a good idea in using them is a good idea. Of course, the question becomes, how do you use them? A prelude to chapter eight, Naaman and Pearson, who basically come up with this uniformly most powerful statement, if you reject, you know, if your p-value is ducks alpha and you reject, then if you build that, how you're computing the p-value based off of ratios of likelihood functions, you'll be uniformly most powerful. We'll get there in chapter eight. That's what Naaman and Pearson actually say. They do it in such a way that you're still integrating over tail probabilities, so there is a violation of the likelihood principle there. So even though they're using likelihood functions, they use them in a way that violates the likelihood principle. So I think this gets a little bit confusing. So I think just looking at some examples might help us out a little bit and decide whether or not we need to adhere to the likelihood principle. All I want you to get out of it is when you violate it, I want you to think to yourself, does it matter? So, and we're just gonna play this game throughout the rest of the class. Did it matter? Do you care? And if you don't care, that's fine. So, um, 
and we'll kind of just play out at least um, fictitiously the roles that I've seen different Bayesians and non-Bayesians play and kind of fight over each other. And I see it as being unproductive. Okay, let's look at some examples. So consider this example, same example from last time. I'll just say I've got some data. I'll call this S. I'll say that we see some heads and tails in here. Okay, so same thing that we had before. Probability of a head. We'll denote as P. The probability of a tail. We'll denote as 1 minus P. I haven't written all this down. The P's live between 0 and 1. They're probabilities. This is just for newly coin flipping. Everything is IID in this case. It's exchangeable. Um, Experimenter one is going to believe maybe this is binomial, and experimenter two is going to believe maybe this is negative binomial. We'll just play some point estimation games. We're not going to develop any strong principles. There's going to be no theory, but later on we'll go back and we'll address in general what these procedures are that we can think about. You should be familiar with some of these already. So let's just think about binomial. So if data is binomially distributed, or at least the successes are binomially distributed. Data, I'll say, had k is equal to 10 fixed. The number of successes and by successes I mean we see a head. So the thing with probability P is binomial. So this is going to be K choose X, P to the X, 1 minus P to the K minus X. So that would be a sampling distribution. I usually write that down like that. Uh, I get accused all the time of being a Bayesian because I write things like this and I always write the conditioning. It's not because I'm about to do the conditional flip. That's not why I write this down and I find it so important. I think it's because if I want to talk about the IID nature of X, I need to say it's X given P. And so I just feel so strongly about that I have to write it down because I don't think that X itself is IID. I think it's model in hand and all the modeling parameters, knowing them and conditioning on them, this is the thing that makes everything in IID. So it's this distribution that factorizes. I just think that's an important point. Um, okay, so, and I'll be really clear about this. Usually I don't put it as zeros and ones, but I guess they could be there. And we know the expectation of X is going to be equal to K times P. So the number of successes. So calculation anybody could do. Let's say experimenter two sees something, thinks just a little bit differently about this. And experimenter two might believe that the number of trials uh, or the number of failures, depending on how you want to think about this, is the random thing. And the number of successes was fixed. So they're just arguing over what, what's random in this process. And to me, equal, each one of them is equally likely to be true. I would say as a statistician, what I would probably insist on um, is I'd probably say, could I have another replicate of this? If we're arguing over that, we can't tell. And if you gave me a couple more replicates and H was always on the end and the number of heads was fixed um, in every sample, then I would probably have a strong indication that it's negative binomial. So if I thought that it mattered, I would say, go get me data that verifies this. And I would insist on it. Or I would have to devise an analysis where it didn't matter which one I assumed. And I would check under both of 
those assumption sets, I would come up with my answer and I'd see whether or not that mattered. So those are the things that I do a little bit more practically. Well, let's just say we're here. We have this and we're gonna argue about the distribution. So negative binomial. So a couple different ways you can think about this distribution. The book writes it down two different ways, so I'll write it down two different ways so you can just experience that. Uh, but I could write everything down like this. K minus one, choose X minus one, P to the X. So this is gonna be the total number of trials. This is gonna be the uh, number of successes. One minus P, and I could write down K minus X, or I could call that Y, the number of failures. So this is the random bit right here, if I think about it, in this parameterization. This is what's random. And K is going to go from X. So probably that's the, the most limiting constraint on the left-hand side. If I'm going to have a fixed number of X trials, I could have flipped the coin and seen X heads in a row, and that would be my total number of trials. So that would be the smallest number of trials that you can have. And this goes off to the just for completeness, let's just write down over here that x can go from 0 all the way to k. So these are very different distributions. Similar, related, but different. I will also say uh, negative binomials, there's a lot of ways you can think about these distributions. So here's another way you can think about it. That if I had a Poisson distribution, which is counting things, like a negative binomial, they're related to each other. So just an aside, and maybe you'll hear this again later on, that if I have x is Poisson, lambda, and I let lambda be gamma, with some parameters in here, and I let these parameters be equal to each other, So this is a gamma with only one parameter in there. So I'll call it alpha alpha. That this is now negative binomial. So it's kind of a cool thing. So lambda is gamma. I sample that from this continuous distribution. Gamma is lived between 0 and infinity. It's a continuum. That parameter lives between 0 and infinity. It lives in the real number line. And so if I sample this, I plug it in here, and then I sample those. It's not Poisson anymore because I have this extra layer of stochasticity in there. These turn out to be negative binomials. So the way I think about this is negative binomials are scale or mixtures over Poissons. Yeah. This thing right here, I should write x given lambda. You would like this to look like this. Yeah. I appreciate that. So yeah, I like writing it that way too. So same point that I was making before, I just did the thing that let's suppress the notation. So we agree, but that just is the thing about notation. We better write it down so that we all agree. So yeah, very good. So those are negative by in this hierarchical fashion. I do this stuff all the time when I'm modeling. So. I take some easy distribution, I start playing around with it, I notice that the residuals from my analysis are off, I try to figure out what's off about them, then I add another layer to my model and adjust for that. And so, and I just carry out this hierarchical modeling thing.
So everything I know about Poisson processes, I can extend over to negative binomial processes through that mixture representation. Very useful tool. Okay, back to this. Another way you could write this, I could change this. So let's just see it the other way. Or we could write the same thing where I see K, I'm just going to replace it. And so K is the number of trials, and so K is equal to X plus Y. And so this is going to be Y plus X minus 1. I might write it down that way. And then I might have this X minus 1 still downstairs. I could write that. So I'm just staring at this binomial coefficient. I'll write in the other stuff in a second. Instead of X minus 1, I can just use that Y. And so sometimes we'll see people write this down, and then they'll have P to the X. That's fixed. And then they'll write down 1 minus P to the Y. And they'll be discussing why is the random bit. So this is the number of failures. And that's what's random. And so the Y's, the number of failures starts at zero and it goes off to infinity, and they're count numbers. So a lot of times when I'm thinking about this distribution, the way that I just wrote it down in that hierarchical fashion, the way I wrote it relates to this parameterization. So because everything can start counting at zero. And so these models are exactly the same, one's just shifted. So by the number of successes. So exactly the same thing, but be careful because it changes all your formulas. So does anybody know what this is? Why is the random bit? I'll be really impressed. I really will be. Somebody's got a lot of study time and memorization skills. So I never know what this is either. X times 1 minus P over P is what it turns out to be. So keep in mind, your expectations are always going to be functions of the things the distribution is conditioned on. So expectations are always functions of the things that are fixed in the distribution. One of my biggest pet peeves is when somebody writes down the expectation for x and x appears over here. That's been integrated out. That's gone, marginalized out, summed over in the discrete case. I still call those integrals in my head. Okay, so that's what it is. So let's do something with all of this. Let's say we just knew this and see if we can build some estimators. Let's see what happens. So we're going to act very unprincipally and just use these two different descriptions of the process and see whether or not it matters, whether or not we've thought about the process differently. So um, for the binomial case, So if I'm conceptualizing this as binomial, I might say the expectation of x is approximately x, where this is my observed value. I usually ask why we can assume that. Well, that's what it's supposed to be. So my expected number of things should be close to the sample. And if it were wildly different, then I probably have the, the wrong model. And so I'm just going to match those two things. So what I've just done is I've matched the empirical moment to the theoretical moment. And if I had a whole bunch of different samples, then I would take the empirical average, and I would match that to the theoretical average. I'll do that later, and we'll generalize up. But if I had a whole bunch of replicated samples, whole bunch of those different S's, I would compute their number of heads and everything, I'd probably be able to end the contest between whether or not it's binomial or negative binomial, 
And then I would just match the observed average to the theoretical average. Makes sense. So people have come up with these ideas before. The empirical app or the theoretical average is just k times p. So as soon as we match these two things to each other, it's not okay to write this down because that's not equal. So this is a very important thing that statisticians need to convey to the rest of the world, is that when you do this, you need to differentiate the truth. What is the true parameter from your estimated parameter? And so as soon as I made this connection, I'm saying I have an approximation and this is just a guess at what P is, and I'm going to denote that by drawing a P, a hat over the P. And you've heard this conversation from everybody. You want to distinguish what the truth is from your estimated value. So that just means that P hat is equal to X over K, and this is the number of successes divided by my number of trials. And if I had done this exact same thing using repeated values and I replaced this with x bar, if I had not just one vector s, but I had repeated vector s's, I would come up with the same thing. I would come up with the number of successes over the number of trials would be my estimate by following this procedure. Let's do this if we're playing around with the negative binomial stuff. The same exact thing. And maybe you want to butter this up and see what happens if you have a repeated number of trials. You can probably do it in your head and see that you're going to get still number of successes over number of trials if I matched kp to x bar. It'll be the same thing. So for the negative binomial, We're going to wind up with an expectation of y. And I'm going to say this is approximately y, my observed number of failures. And so I'm going to say this right here is x times 1 minus p over p. I'm going to verify that that's correct. That's correct. I wrote it on my hand this morning, just to make sure. So, <laughs> just to express the point, I, ne I never remember this either. I could derive it. We could spend the five minutes doing that. You should probably do that. Just to remind yourself you know how to do that. But I also have just limited number of memory banks. There's only so many things I remember. So I will say, uh, if we do this on an exam, I'll probably get since it's not common. But I would like you to know the more obvious ones. So x times this, but as soon as I set that equal to y, I made a mistake in doing this. And this is a mistake that I'll ding you off on an exam for. As soon as you do that, as soon as you set this equal, you better make that hat hat and get rid of that equal sign. So it's a bit of a pet peeve to me when people just have equal signs running all together and there's not a, that's not equal anymore. This implies that these two things are equal. And I've just invoked a technique for creating an estimator. And to denote that, I put a hat on top of the keys. So I think it's important not to say things are equal when they're not. So. Okay, so a few of you I marked off some points, not too many on the exams, but you'll want to break yourself of that habit. So, and then I can solve for everything. Let's do that. So this is going to be one line. I'll do it in a couple steps. P hat is going to be equal to y over x. So I'll divide both sides by y. I'm going to say this implies that 1 over P hat is going to be equal to y over x plus 1. So I've just rewritten this with a 1, added it to both sides. I'm going to do this all in one step and invert this. 
or are you right here? All right, so I can add the fractions together. And this is going to look like x over y plus x at the end of the day. So this was a 1. I turned it into an x over x. I added everything together, and then I inverted it. I know that it's 9 o'clock in the morning. So I'll let you chew on that. All these details that we go over, whatever they are, this one's a little bit light. We can always do in review session. So that's what those are designed for. So what is this? This is the number of successes over my number of trials. Did I make a mistake? No. Okay. I usually think when I hear a whispering, it's, it's I've done something wrong. My zipper's down or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just know when you whisper, I think. <laughs> So we got the same answer, the exact same thing. So let me just ask a question. Did we violate the likelihood principle? to come up with expectations. And so I matched moments. I just looked at the moments of the distribution, the first moments. I matched them. I didn't use likelihoods to come up with expectations to all of this stuff. I marginalized over X space to do it. And so and then I matched everything. And so it wasn't necessary that I use the sufficient statistic to do this. I did use the sufficient statistic, but I did violate the conditionality principle in doing everything. And so, yes. Did it matter? No. I got, and in fact, everybody's reasonable answer is this answer. Number of successes over number of trials, that's not supposed to be the amazing part. It's that we violated the likelihood principle, and it didn't matter. Nothing went wrong. So, so does it matter? One of the most annoying things you can do to somebody, I'll let you answer this for yourself, is to say, well, that's not a good explanation because you violated the likelihood principle. And so somebody said, I don't adhere to the likelihood principle. Moving on. And it's like, well, you shouldn't. Why? <laughs> you know? So I think that's what happens here is you can violate the likelihood principle and everything can work out just totally fine. I've developed an estimator. And regardless of how I've motivated that estimator, I've come up with it, all I have to do is study properties of this estimator now. And so, and some people think about things like that. So there's camps of statisticians that say it really is your explanation and the way you've derived it and the principles that you follow that make you a good statistician. And then there's some people that say it doesn't matter at all. All that matters is you did something to come up with an estimator and you've studied the properties of that estimator and you've compared it to other, other estimators. And it's hard to disagree with that. So the way that I've sided with this in my life is having principles is a good idea. It steers you in the right direction, but at the end of the day, we're all going to do the latter. And we're going to study properties of the estimators and it probably doesn't matter how you got it. So I'll say Dennis Lindley, is probably of the camp um, that it absolutely matters what you're thinking about as you derive something and somebody like Tukey is the type that says it doesn't matter at all and so very different 
perspectives on these things. You're allowed to come up with your own blend. So I think it kind of matters, it helps me, but at the end of the day, I'm still gonna agree with the, the latter case. Let's look at another way of coming up with this. So maybe there's a way we could use the likelihood function and come up with an estimator. Let's see what we do, what we come up with. So the likelihood, And I'll say for the binomial case, just to, it doesn't actually matter in this case, but if I wrote down the likelihood thinking with my binomial cap, um, I would write this down. So K choose X, P to the X, one minus P to the K minus X. I might be thinking about it that way. So that's my likelihood function. Keep in mind, Likelihood functions are really proportional to the kernel. This thing, the kernel is the thing that contains the parameter. There's no parameter here, and so to be proportional to this, it means I can throw that away. As we already know from the negative binomial example, the only part we're disagreeing in is the stuff that's gonna get tossed anyway. So anytime people use likelihood, they use them in a relative fashion, usually something like a, a ratio. So the law of likelihood looks like this. So what we might want to do is we might want to maximize this. So I'm kind of assuming you've seen all this before. So maybe we want to maximize this. So I've never heard of a lowest maximum estimate, maximum likelihood estimator. The lowest likely, lowest likelihood estimator. It just doesn't sound good. Why would I want something that's not very likely? So where this is peaking is supposed to tell us the likely place where the estimator lives. And so it's an aptly named function. Um, the log likelihood looks like this. It's just going to be x times log p plus k minus x log 1 minus p plus the logarithm of the constant. So this is just a shift in the log likelihood space. My, one of my pet peeves is that there's no notation to say that this is equal to something up to additive shift. We just don't have notation for it. So, but oftentimes that additive shift doesn't matter. So if I'm gonna maximize this, I can maximize that because logarithms are a monotonic function. And so I haven't changed where the modes are in that distribution, where the maxima are. Um, and so I can do that just by taking derivatives and setting them equal to P, or setting them equal to zero. And we'll do that just real quick. So again, I'm kind of assuming you've seen all this before. But we'll come back and we'll do this slower and generalize these principles later. So this is going to go x over p. Derivative of log p is 1 over p. This is going to be k minus x over 1 minus p. I need to be careful with the chain rule. I've got a minus p there. And this is my pet peeve when people go and they set it equal to zero because it's not zero. So when you set it equal to zero, you're finding the maximums. You're finding the flat regions of that derivative. And you're invoking some theory that you have. And so when you do that, you should tell us, not with an equal sign. So you'll do something like this, x over p hat minus k minus x over 1 minus p hat is equal to 0. So as soon as I've done that, I just invoked a property about maximums and how to find them. And so I'm using some algorithm. And I'd probably even give this a little bit more notation and just say that this is the maximum likelihood estimator because I'm maximizing the likelihood. One of my most favorite named things in the world because it tells us exactly what it is. So, I like that. And we can solve for p hat in this. 
So at the end of the day, I'll let you work through the details. It's identical to this calculation right here. And so p hat, if I just take this and I write down, um, do the swap, separate everything to one side, I take one minus p hat over p hat, shift the one to the other side, we will wind up with p hat ml8 is the number of successes divided by the number of failures. And if I had used the negative binomial distribution to do this, I should write zero. When I took the derivative with respect to the constant, that was zero. There's no keys there. If I had used the negative binomial distribution, I would have had a different constant there, but as soon as I took the derivative, it wouldn't matter. And so for the negative binomial distribution, we come up with the exact same estimator. Here's the punchline. Did we violate the likelihood principle in doing this? Here's the answer. No. I know you guys are bashful because you think there's a fight about a breakout. We won't do that in this class. So, no, we didn't violate the likelihood principle. And so, this is the most irritating thing in the world. When somebody says, well, that estimator's okay because it didn't violate the likelihood principle, but the other one's not okay. And they're exactly the same. So let's just keep iterating through this so that you're prepared for this in your statistical careers, what people might invoke, and whether or not you think it matters. Saying that, I do kind of like this, that the likelihood built, builds into it the um, bounds. 0 to 1, P has to live between 0 and 1. And what you'll see, and there's examples in the book, so I encourage you to start reading through that, that if you do the first thing we did by matching moment, there's no guarantee that you're either going to be in the valid ranges of the parameter space. But for likelihood-based methods, they'll always build that in. It'll be constrained. We'll see later on whether or not you really like the likelihood principle. We'll see what my mood is later on, because I switch my mind on it all the time, whether or not I think it's a big deal. So we're going to come back next time. We'll kind of look at Bayesian procedures and kind of finish up this example, then we're going to generalize everything. And then we're going to study the properties of all of these different statistics that we derive using these various principles. Just real quick, questions? No, I think that's correct. It's number of fake Oh. Trials. Yes. Thank you. I hate when I do stuff like that. Yeah, that really blows my punchline, doesn't it? They're exactly the same. Okay, now they're exactly the same. Okay, so I'll just hand out the midterms. Let me turn off my camera real quick. And again...